Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BRLSI uh, World Affairs series. Uh, my name is Andreas Wasmut, and I'm the convener for World Affairs at the BLSI, as well as the chairman of the program. I'm delighted that uh, so many of you have been able to uh, join us today for this most important uh, topic. Before we get started on tonight, I would just like to cover off the etiquette for tonight, which is because there's so many of us, uh, all the questions will be via the chat room. And I shall pick out the the chats, uh, the the comments, and put them uh, to Rajan and to Paul, our two speakers today, uh, which I think will help the flow. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, everybody is off uh, camera uh, because of the number of people who've joined today, and also you're all muted because I think that will just help uh, proceedings uh, today. The only other thing is, so please put your questions in the chat room uh, and I will pick them out and put them forward. Please also note uh, that uh, today's meeting is recorded. So a transcript of this will be available on the BLSI YouTube channel uh, in about four weeks time. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that will give you further insight because the story uh, will have moved on. In four weeks time, we'll be in a very different place to where we are now. But now over to tonight, and I'm it's with great delight that uh, I uh, would like to introduce uh, Paul Danieri and Raja Menon, uh, who both will give us uh, uh, their talk uh, on the current crisis in the Ukraine. Paul will initially focus on the, there's a background to it, some of the history and some of the context, and Rajan will then follow with another 25-minute presentation in terms of the current situation and, and looking forward. So after 50 minutes or so, we then get to the Q&A session, and please, please, please put everything in the uh, chat room, which I can then pick out. But on to uh, today's uh, event. Uh, at the BLSI, uh, the talks program is a key element of our cultural activities. And every year we host in the region of about 120 talks. Tonight's talk talks are without doubt of the highest significance and poignancy. What started as a political crisis escalated to a military crisis, which in turn led to a humanitarian crisis, the biggest crisis, humanitarian crisis since World War II, with refugees already exceeding 3 million. It is of paramount importance that we understand the political, social, humanitarian and economic impacts of what is one of the, if not the, existential crisis of the 21st century. I'm therefore delighted to introduce our two speakers tonight. Paul Danieri is Professor of Public Policy and Political Science and former Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost of University of California, Riverside. He studies politics in the former Soviet Union, focusing on Ukraine and on Ukraine-Russia relations. He also teaches and studies economics and budgeting in universities based on his experience as an administrator at UCR, the University of Florida and the University of Kansas. His books are varied and include Ukraine and Russia, from civilized divorce to uncivilized war, which you will see behind him today, uh, international politics, power and purpose of uh, political power. The next one, is, uh, bear with me, my screen has gone slightly awry. Right. This, then also uh, the uh, book, The Sources of Russia's Great Power Politics, Ukraine, and the challenge to the European order and understanding Ukrainian politics. So as you see, I, extremely well qualified uh, to talk on uh, today's subject. Okay, our second speaker is Rajan Menon, Professor Rajan Menon. He's the Emeritus Ann and Bernard Spitzer Chair in Political Science at the City University of New York. He is a senior research scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, Columbia University, and a global ethics fellow at the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs. His books include The Conceit of Humanitarian Intervention, The End of Alliances, Ukraine in Conflict, The Unwinding of the Cold War Order, Soviet Power and the Third World. 
So, as you will all agree, both Rajan and Paul eminently qualified and experienced in talking to us tonight. It's with great pleasure that I initially hand over to Paul, uh, who will give us the background. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. It's uh, it's great to be with you in Bath. I wish I wish I were in person with you in Bath, uh, but but these are the times we live in. Um, so I'm going to primarily provide an overview from uh, 1991 uh, to 2022, based on the book that's sitting behind me, um, which is called uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, From Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War. And the big question that I uh, really am asking and trying to answer for you tonight is, uh, how did we get from what many people in 1991 called the civilized divorce between Ukraine and Russia to the, the violent conflict that we see today? Now, it's, um, it's impossible in 25 minutes to touch on all the important events, so um, I'm not going to necessarily try uh, to do that, but, um, but I also am going to talk very fast, so I apologize for that in advance. But I'm going to highlight four themes um, that I think help us understand what happened. And to summarize, those points are, and I'm actually going to show some slides here so that you can see what these points are. Okay, and... Can you see the slides now? Can I get a thumbs up, Roger? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. So, um, so the main themes are this. Um, first, the disagreements between Ukraine and Russia uh, and between Russia and the West go all the way back to the very beginning of the post-Cold War period. Later arguments, uh, I contend, uh, such as NATO expansion, were symptoms of a conflict, um, not causes themselves. Uh, second, the, the situation in Europe was a classic security dilemma. Um, in, in, in uh, which Ukraine was sort of the territory on which this dilemma played out. Uh, in other words, what that means is um, the, the things that the sides did, Russia and the West, to try to um, increase their own security naturally made each other uh, less secure. And that was true whether anybody uh, uh, really intended to revise the status quo or not. Uh, but of course, Russia did want to change the status quo. Um, a third point then is that again and again, there were competing understandings of what the status quo was um, and therefore what was a legitimate action and, there, and what was an illegitimate action. And then the third thing that actually I think is probably the most important is the way that democratization and the spread of democracy um, merged with uh, geopolitics um, in ways that sort of pitted the West's belief in the universal value of democracy against Russia's conception of its national interests. Um, but before I get into the 1991 period, I'm going to review a bit of history. When I say a bit of history, I mean a thousand years, um, because there are a lot of references to history in this conflict, um, particularly from Vladimir Putin, but, but, but from others. And the overarching point I want to make here, and of course, I'm going to really just skim over this, um, but the overarching point I want to make is that there are at least two versions of the history of Ukraine and Russia. First, there's a Russian version that stresses historic unity and friendship, and that Putin has advanced uh, recently a particular, I would say, um, um, inaccurate version of. Um, and there's a Ukrainian version that stresses separateness, conquest, colonialism, and repression. And the point I'll make is that this is not entirely about facts, but about the way that we connect them and the meanings we derive from them. And frankly, the way that we deploy them for political uh, advantage. Um, so why isn't that slide moving forward? There we go. Um, so, so here's just a, a little bit. Let me go back one. There we go. Um, I'm not going to go through all this history. Again, it's, a, it's more than a thousand years, but I want to make a couple of, of key points. Uh, first, the city of Kiev was an important trading and religious center all the way back as far as the ninth century. Uh, it was the center of this loose federation known as Kiev and Rus'. It was governed at that time actually by Norse princes because they had taken control of it as a, uh, a key trading post on the route between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. In 988 AD, uh, 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 Prince Valdemar, uh, seeking essentially for political reasons, seeking better ties with the Byzantine Empire, adopted Christianity and had the population of Kiev baptized en masse. Now that might seem like it was a long time ago, but this is the sort of stuff that people like Putin um, talk about as though it were the week before last and it and it really shapes things that happen today. Moscow doesn't arise really as a city and as a power until several hundred years later, um, and it begins expanding. And, and as we know, it expands dramatically all the way to the Pacific coast um, and eventually into uh, to what is today Poland and other places as well. 
Um, but as it begins expanding, um, its princes and later its tsars legitimize their rule um, and their expansion on the claim that they are the heirs to Kiev and Rus, both in religious affairs and territorially. Um, and so the Russian Empire, which it was for all those centuries, was an empire, and it expanded, as I said, dramatically. Um, periodically, the Ukrainians rebelled, or people in the Ukrainian territories rebelled, Ukrainian Cossacks and others, but they always were defeated either by the Russians um, or by the Poles uh, to their west. Um, one, one key point to, to, uh, to uh, allude to is the reign of Catherine the Great in the late 19th, uh, 18th century, when she um, um, basically, uh, uh, in the partition of Poland, in which a, a big chunk of what is today Western Ukraine uh, becomes integrated into the Russian Empire, she famously says, we only took what, uh, what was ours. And, and so that's a neat summary of this Russian view that for religious reasons and ethnic re reasons, stuff that maybe they had not controlled for, for centuries, nonetheless somehow belongs to them. Um, it's equally the case that the Ukrainians and Russians tend to look at the history of the 20th century quite differently. And so we'll, we'll zip up into the history of the 20th century. Um, so in, in uh, speaking just before the invasion, Vladimir Putin criticized Lenin. And this was really fascinating. He really went after Lenin because Lenin was really responsible for forming the Soviet Union on a federal structure. And that created uh, Ukraine, at least some of, uh, its, in its, some of the 1991 borders. Uh, Ukrainians focus on a different history. At the end of World War I, uh, the Ukrainians declared a formation, the formation of a Ukrainian Republic, but to make a very long, complicated story short, um, it was defeated by the Red Army. Um, while Ukrainians point to what they call the Holodomor, the terror famine in 1932 and 1933, uh, in which during collect, uh, Stalin's collectivization campaign, in which something on the order of 4 million Ukrainians starved to death, the Russian historiography sees the famine as an accident and one that affected not only um, Ukraine, but Russia and Kazakhstan as well. So more of a disaster than a genocide. Um, and, I, and, and it's worth pointing out that, that Stalin himself has gotten very much more popular in Russia these days, and to Ukrainians, that is uh, um, inexplicable and ominous. So while two million Ukrainians, rough, rough numbers, um, were in the Red Army, fought in the Red Army against the Germans in World War II, a small number um, seeking to throw off Soviet and Russian rule sought an alliance with Germany. And this is the root of the charge that you hear that, that Ukrainian nationalists are fascists. Um, after World War II, some of these Ukrainian insurgents um, fought an insurgency against the reimposition of Soviet rule um, that wasn't wiped out in the in the sort of in the woods and, and hillsides of Western Ukraine until 1950. So I think we could spend hours arguing about everything I just said. Did I highlight the right things? Did I interpret them correctly? What did I leave out? Um, but I really actually want to just focus on the period after 1991 because I think the history prior to 1991 um, is never going to fully do what people want it to do. It's not going to tell us who is right um, or who is wrong or necessarily even what the conflict is about. Uh, it only really tells us, I think, that the, any history that stretches out over this period of time yields competing interpretations uh, and that those competing interpretations are used to justify competing political claims. Um, in my personal opinion, the only thing really to rely on um, in, in just saying what should belong to whom in this in this context is uh, is international law and and the boundaries that exist, um, and that's why in post World War II Europe the, the history of, of this region is a history in which borders were revised every forty or fifty years or so, if not more often than that, going back a thousand years, and so that's why in post World War II Europe. Uh, the states agreed to stop revising boundaries through force. They redrew them after World War II, um, and, then, and then they said they're not going to be changed through, through force anymore. And that's why after the end of communism and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Poland, Hungary, uh, and most of the states in the West agreed not to contest those borders, um, no matter what anybody thought about uh, how they were created. And in that respect, the relationship between Poland and Ukraine is especially interesting, because historically, could say Poland and Ukraine had as much enmity as Ukraine and Russia, but they just decided to bury it. Uh, not so Russia. So getting to the post-1991 period. The first point um, I want to get to is that um, the, these tensions go back uh, uh, 
right to the beginning of this period. The coup that spurred the breakup of the Soviet Union was in fact orchestrated by a group of men who believed that the, uh, the Union Treaty that Gorbachev was putting forward, a new revision of the Union Treaty, was going to give the other republics, including Ukraine, too much autonomy. After the coup, when Boris Yeltsin was the new democratic uh, uh, president of Russia, or so we hoped, um, he sought to have the Russian government supplant the Soviet one, but he did not intend for Ukraine to become completely uh, independent. He only agreed to the severing of the 1922 Union Treaty because it was a way for him to get rid of Gorbachev. But as part of, get of, of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia dissolving the 1922 uh, Union Treaty, this Treaty of Lenin's that, Gorbachev, uh, that, uh, that Putin hated, he insisted that there be a new agreement, this new formation of what was called the Commonwealth of Independent States. And so uh, Yeltsin himself says this um, in 1991. Right, we, we, we've got to keep our three Slav states, by which he means Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, from splitting apart. But Leonid Kravchuk, who's, who's the Ukraine's first president who had just been elected, uh, will have none of it. And Kravchuk's position largely came out of the referendum on independence that was held by Ukraine in December of 1991. So this was, uh, I think, widely regarded as a free and fair election. And I'll just read some results of that because I think they're important. Nationwide in Ukraine, um, 90 percent of the voters voted for independence. In Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, uh, the number in both of those oblasts was 78 percent. And in Crimea, it was still a majority, although a smaller majority of 54 percent. Um, so Kravchuk very much felt like there was a mandate from the Ukrainian people to say, no, we're out. Um, so he insisted on a very weak, non-binding version of this Commonwealth of Independent States. And this was the, the so-called civilized divorce. Uh, that I refer to in the title of my book and that people also talk about. Within Russia, I think at the time, there were two views about Ukraine. Um, one was that economic dislocation um, would naturally bring Ukraine back to Russia and Russia just needed to be patient. The other was that if that didn't happen, Russia needed to, to sort of force or cajole Ukraine back in, largely through economic coercion or by stirring up the Russian population in Ukraine. But what was really not debated in Ukraine was whether, uh, I'm sorry, what was not debated in Russia was whether uh, Ukraine ought to be part of Russia. There was only a tiny, tiny slice of the most Western-oriented um, elite that believed that they should just let Ukraine go and forget about it. And that elite um, was marginalized quite quickly. Now, as I said, Ukraine had, had different ideas and complained about, uh, for, complained from the beginning about Russia's role. And so just here's one example of that from its, pre uh, this was uh, Elena Kuchma, who was prime minister at the time of this quotation, but later became president. Um, so the civilized divorce obscured the fact um, that this disagreement was there from the very beginning. And I'm gonna now um, change gears a little bit to talk about the disagreement from the West, between the West and Russia that I also argue was uh, there from the beginning. And then specifically, I'm gonna talk about Yugoslavia, which is where a lot of this came to a head in the early uh, to mid 1990s and even into the late 1990s over Kosovo. Um, Yugoslavia divided Russia and the West on what they both saw as existential issues. The West was committed to the idea that it was not going to stand aside for another genocide in Europe, right? Never again was the, was the phrase. Um, and that, and that, that uh, um, need was more important than Russia's claims that as an historic great power, it should have a veto over everything that happens in Europe. Um, and the lesson uh, for the West was that the kind of security architecture that Ukraine wants in which Russia uh, has a say over everything that happens in Europe won't work because Russia is going to let the Serbs uh, uh, um, do what it wants, do what they want to the Bosnians and the Croats. So again, just a couple of quotations for you. Um, this is Vitaly Churkin um, uh, uh, in the Russian Foreign Ministry um, in March 1993, talking about Yugoslavia as it heats up, and then, and then Bill Clinton. Um, so very different notions very early on in, in, in terms of what is at stake. And in my opinion, it's hard to overestimate how much Yugoslavia did to the relationship between Russia and the West in this very early formative period, because already it was clear there was an incompatibility of objectives, of expectations, and of norms. 
And it's the same kind of incompatibility of objectives and norms that was to later characterize relations over Ukraine. Um, the situation, so a second major point, right? The, 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 the situation in, in post-1991 Europe was this classic security dilemma by which we mean everybody wants more security, but what one side to does to, what one side does to make themselves more secure, um, others uh, feel makes them less secure. So already after the collapse of the Soviet Union, these countries that had just been occupied recently by the Soviet Union were looking for some guarantor of security. And what happened in Yugoslavia only exaggerated that. So, um, So NATO enlargement initially was intended to do two things, to reassure these countries in Central Europe and to um, help ensure that they consolidate a democracy uh, by saying, basically, you can't get into NATO unless you do all these things to consolidate democracy. But Russia saw this, of course, as threatening to its interests. I don't think Russia realistically thought NATO was going to invade, but certainly it was already impinging on an area that Russia saw as its sphere of influence. Um, and the same was true later, uh, getting closer to 2013 and 2014, over the discussion of whether Ukraine was going to align uh, economically with Russia or, or with the West. And so already by 1994, Ukraine was caught in the, in the middle of this. In January 1994, and I've been surprised at how little talk of this there, there's been since this invasion. In January of 1994, Ukraine agreed to give up the nuclear weapons that it had inherited because they were stationed on Ukrainian territory at the time of the Soviet collapse. And up until that time, Russia and the United States actually had joined together to coerce Ukraine to, to get rid of these weapons. Once Ukraine got rid of the weapons, uh, the United States sort of um, saw Ukraine now as a potential asset um, in terms of a hedge against what might happen, uh, what might happen in Russia. And in this respect, it's also to point out um, how early things went wrong in Russia. In October of 1993, uh, Yeltsin forcibly disbanded the Russian Duma. Um, the the uh, it wasn't called the Duma at that time, um, but the the parliament um, using tanks right to actually force them out of out of the building and shelling the Russian parliament building. He wrote a new constitution which gave an immense amount of power to the presidency to the president, and he held new parliamentary elections. And in those elections in December of 1993. Uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky's party, and Zhirinovsky himself was clearly a neo-fascist, um, won those elections, with, with, had the biggest chunk of the vote, uh, with about 20 percent, and, and the Communist Party came in third, uh, with Yeltsin's party sandwiched in between. And so from that time forward, Zhirinovsky's party has been represented in the Russian uh, Duma, um, and it's a pretty overtly neo-fascist party, whereas in Ukraine, um, which Putin accuses of being fascist, uh, the far right parties have never gotten more than a couple of percent. But the point for the history is that people all in the West already in 1993 and getting into early 1994 are thinking, holy smokes, it looks like there's this red brown coalition of, of conservatives in Russia, sort of neo revanchist communists and neo fascists, and they're aligning together to get rid of Yeltsin. What are we going to do about that? And so in the spring of 1994, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, famous American strategic thinker, man about the, the Soviet Union and former Soviet Union and former national security advisor, uh, writes an article in Foreign Affairs that gets an immense amount of attention um, in which he advances this idea of geopol geopolitical pluralism. And the famous line about uh, Russia cannot be an empire without Ukraine, but with Ukraine, it is an empire. Um, and that kind of became the cornerstone of American strategy and the West strategy towards Ukraine, which is it's just important to the extent that the Ukrainians want to be independent of Russia, uh, that, it, that, that Ukraine not be conquered, because when it does get conquered by, Ukraine, by Russia, or if it does, then we've got much bigger problems on our hands. And I think that thinking has largely persisted until now. Um, Andriy Kozarev, the foreign minister at the time, um, responded in the next issue of foreign affairs with a counter argument. Um, and I think this is interesting because Kozarev is one of the most liberal pro-Western uh, Russian elites at this time, right? And he's saying, look, we've got to be, a, for we've got to be uh, a great power and we've got to be acknowledged as a great power and we are a great power. So uh, again, early on, there's this very uh, different notion of what this region is supposed to look like and what Russia's role in it should be. 
Um, so when it comes to NATO enlargement then or expansion, um, what the West sees as hedging its bets and spreading democracy uh, to the Russia, to Russia looks like trying to hem it in. Um, and so there is these, these competing uh, um, understandings then of what is the status quo? What is the baseline that we compare everything else to um, and, and digressions from which look like aggression or look like they're illegitimate? Russia, I think, tends to focus on a status quo of 1990. Eastern Europe has been set free, but Ukraine is still part of Russia. Um, and, and NATO is where NATO was, uh, you know, in, in the 1990s, really before the reunification of, of Germany. Or so, I, so I should say it's where it was in the 1980s. Um, Ukraine and the West are more focused on the status quo of 1992. Ukraine is independent, full stop. Um, and so while Russia sees itself as restoring a status quo, which is legitimate, Ukraine and the West see revanchism or revisionism, which is illegitimate. And when the West supports Ukraine's independence, Russia sees aggression. And of course, we see this in the whole uh, debate about NATO expansion. Um, to, to NATO, there's really no status quo that's being violated. There's just a principle, right, that NATO is open to all comers as long as they're democracies. Uh, Russia sees it, of course, quite differently. And so we get to these contrasting um, um, reactions then to the 2008 Bucharest summit, where um, you know, uh, where, where NATO uh, uh, declines to offer a membership action plan to Georgia and Ukraine. And instead, it makes this very vague statement that someday Georgia and Ukraine will be allowed to join the alliance. And to many of us, I think, when the, when the alliance said someday they'll be allowed to join, that was a very diplomatic way of saying you're never going to be allowed to join um, because we don't want to alienate Russia. Um, but Russia tended to, to, to see things this way. Um, On top of all this, there was this force uh, um, that was undermining the status quo. So even though the sides didn't agree on what the status quo was to begin with, even if they had, there was this inexorable force that kept on changing things and kept on changing countries' alignments. And that force was democratization. Um, it merged with geopolitics in a way that pitted the West belief in the universal value of democracy against Russia's uh, conception of its national interests. And uh, I'll just point to a couple quotations there, right? Uh, this, is, this is sort of the, the U.S. position in the mid-1990s, and I'll let you read that for a second before I go on. But I'll just say the, um, the merger of democratization and geopolitics reached its peak in the Orange Revolution. The West saw this as a great triumph of people power over autocratic thugs. The, the, uh, Russia saw this as uh, externally driven subversion with geopolitical goals, even though Russia itself, to be clear, was absolutely trying to subvert uh, Ukrainian politics at that time. Uh, Gleb Pavlovsky, who at the time was one of uh, Putin's uh, fixers in Ukraine, said, uh, said the Orange Revolution was our 9-11. Um, and just to give you another sense of how NATO uh, um, integrated the spread of democracy into its mission in a way that I think looked uh, not so pleasant from the Russian perspective. So just fast forward again to this idea of the spread of democracy and how it influences Russia. Uh, the 2000 protests in, in Russia um, when, when uh, the Russian parliamentary elections were, let's just say, not entirely free and fair, sponsored this big protest movement. Um, and here's what, what Putin had to say. Um, and here's what John McCain, who at the time was in the United States Senate, had to say, really almost just trying to tweak Putin with the idea that he was going to be um, overthrown, right? Not exactly the... Um, height of, of diplomacy, I think we would agree. Um, but that, that was the sense, was that the spread of democracy became almost um, unified with the ouster of Putin, and in Putin's mind, with Russia then uh, becoming subject to Western pressure. So as I wrap up here, I'm going to stop the screen share because I don't have any more juicy quotations for you. And you're just going to have to look at me. Um, so given what I've said, why didn't we see the invasion of 2014 coming or this one coming in 2022? And I think the simple answer is that we thought they were going to um, recede with time. And they, and they um, rather than receding, they got more intense. So let me briefly say um, what happened, uh, what I think happened between the small war of 2014 and the massive war of 2022. Um, I think the big picture is to the extent that occupying Donbass uh, Luhansk and, and Donetsk Oblast 
was intended to compel the Ukrainian government to submit to Russia's preferred version of things, it didn't work, right? The Ukrainians basically said, okay, you've got that. Now we're going to dig in and see what happens. And I think five things happened since 2015, which might have convinced Putin that waiting for things to get better was not a good idea, that things were likely to get worse, not better. And so now is the best time to invade. First of all, Ukrainians, because of what happened in 2014, were essentially identifying, uh, they're politically identifying away from Russia and towards Ukraine. Second, the Ukrainian government was moving more closely to Europe, finally signed the association agreement that had been such an issue in 2014. It was also moving further away from Russia. And there's this in, in, important story about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church getting uh, ecumenical uh, autonomy or autocephaly from the Russian Orthodox Church, breaking this age old um, religious link. Um, moreover, Ukraine, as I said, did not make concessions in these in these negotiations. And in particular, when Volodymyr Zelensky became president in, in 2019, Putin, I think, thought this guy's going to do a deal with me. He's a novice. He's a rookie. He's a Russian speaker. But it didn't happen. And I think that probably frustrated Putin. Finally, um, finally, in 2021, 20, uh, pro-Putin forces in Ukraine were beginning to get challenged. His man in Ukraine, a guy named Viktor Medvedchuk, was arrested and put in jail on treason charges. And media outlets linked to uh, Medvedchuk were closed down on the grounds that they were actually owned by foreign uh, actors. And so there was this set of things then that I'm now speculating in retrospect, though I did not predict this in advance, um, uh, I think might have convinced Putin that, that this is going to get worse before it gets better. And so we might as well go for it. Last thing I want to say is, um, does this mean that this war was inevitable? And I want to stress the answer is no. Giving the history of something does not make it inevitable. Um, many much tougher conflicts than this have been uh, managed without war. Um, but I do think that there was this problem where this big problem between the West and Russia and the smaller problem between Ukraine and Russia became merged into one, and it made both of them harder to deal with. Um, as far as what might have been done to prevent it, uh, I think I'll leave that for the question and answer. I apologize, I've gone a few minutes over, but I think uh, Rajan will uh, cover anything that I might have missed. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul, very much indeed. Uh, you know, if, if people could unmute, then there they would be a big round of applause, but obviously they can't because there's so many of us uh, on this call. So thank you very much indeed, Paul, for, for a very good uh, context of the situation, you know, not just going back decades, but you know, even longer. So I think it just demonstrates that uh, we, we live in a perfect storm at the moment, as far as the Ukraine and Russia are concerned, with lots of uh, influences that have come through. Uh, I now hand over to, to Rajan, who is going to take us through the sort of current situation uh, and, uh, and potentially uh, looking forward for the next 25 minutes before we throw it open to the Q&A. There's a few questions coming in already uh, at the, in the chat room, which is great. Keep them coming and please indicate whether they are primarily for Paul or for Rajan, and then I will ask them uh, when Rajan finishes. Over to you, Rajan. Thank you very much, Andreas, and uh, good afternoon from New York, ladies and gentlemen, all 85 of you. Uh, I mentioned New York because New York, in the best of times, is a very noisy city. Today, you may hear some of that noise because there's construction going on in the building behind me. I have no control over it, so bear with me if you hear too much of it, Andreas, uh, tell me to speak louder, and I will. The very fact that 85 of you are here today, and I spoke to an audience the other day that was precisely 85, as, as it turns out, tells us something, and that is that we are witnessing now the biggest crisis between Russia and the West since the end of the Cold War. It is safe to say that to the extent that there was a post-Cold War order, this war has shattered that order. It is also safe to say that the war, however it ends, on whatever terms it ends, will create a rift between Russia and the West that will not be breached, that will not be healed as long as Vladimir Putin remains president. He's 69 years old and appears to be healthy, although there are all kinds of rumors that he has this or that ailment. So that is why we're, we're here. To give you a sense of where I'm going to take you, my presentation is not going to be chronological. 
I'm going to try to touch on six points. I always hesitate to do this with my students because then I end up messing up the order. But roughly it's this. Why is it that Ukraine is so important, apart from the things that Paul mentioned about history and so on, that Putin would risk an all-out invasion of this country? And it has been a risk. Second, what about this war do we need to understand and what are going to be its consequences and what might victory mean? Third, the sanctions, the only tool that the West has had. What are they? What can we expect by virtue, by, by way of success? And what are some of the consequences that we might want to know about because they will affect us? Fourth, the debate over arming Ukraine. Well, the debate is settled because Ukraine is being armed. But is there anything else, anything about that that we need to know about, even those of us who think that Ukraine has the right to defend itself and the West is right in arming Ukraine? Fifth, there is a discussion here in the United States about two things, putting a no-fly zone over Ukraine so Russian jets cannot strike targets below, whether with bombs or missiles. And then regime change. Is this the beginning of the end of Vladimir Putin's authoritarian state and ought this to be used as an opportunity to bring it to an end? And then sixth, has Putin succeeded? So let me start with importance. I now work for a think tank called Defense Priorities. It's in DC, Washington DC, a city that I'm not very fond of. And I, therefore, am based in New York and work virtually. But we do a lot of meetings with members of the press. Almost invariably, they ask the question, why is it that Putin cares so much about Ukraine? And my answer is that there are two parts to addressing this question. One is geography and demography. And the other, for want of a better word, and I don't mean to trivialize it, is emotion. And I'll get to emotion in a second, although Paul has covered a lot of that ground. Geography. In land area, Ukraine is 233,000 square miles, which makes it, if you keep Russia aside, the largest country in Europe, almost twice as large as Poland, slightly larger than France. It is in population 44 million, Again, if you set Russia aside, and I say set Russia aside because Russia is a Eurasian country and people look at it in different ways. I'm not denying the European aspirations of Russia. If you look at it in population, it's sixth if you don't count Russia. The Russia-Ukraine border is 1,270 miles long. There are only three states that have a longer border with Russia. They are in order, China, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. East to west, Ukraine is 882 miles long, and it has a sea coast along the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, about 2,700 miles. Now, I'm a very low-tech person, but I want to share the screen and put up a map so you can make sense of what some of what I've said, but also some of what I'll say. So let me try to share the screen. Good, so far. Let me point out to you a couple of things. Here is the Dnieper River. Remember, Paul talked about the the two treaties, the Treaty of Pereslav and the Treaty of Andrusovo. Roughly speaking, the part east of the Dnieper River became attached to Russia in the mid-17th century. That's the only part that has been continuously part of Russia for 300 and some years. So keep this river in mind. Keep Kiev in mind. Keep the city of Chernihiv in mind, north of Kiev. Uh, Keep in mind the western city of Lviv. I'll mention why. Keep in mind a city that you can't see here, but it's called Ivano-Frankivsk, just north of Romania. Then let me direct your attention to the Black Sea coast. Notice how big it is and the fact that it occupies a large area, but then melds into the Sea of Azov. Out of the Sea of Azov is the Kerch Strait. And here we have the Crimean Peninsula. Finally, the city of Kharkiv, which is the second largest city in Ukraine and until 1938 was its capital. Finally, the Donbass. So the Luhansk and Donetsk are both cities and provinces. 
The two separatist republics that Russia has suborned since 2014 occupy about a third of those provinces. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, move ahead. So can, I, I assume you can all see me. Right. So the geography is very important. Now, Paul mentioned the debate over NATO expansion. Why were the Russians so concerned about the prospect of Ukraine entering NATO? One reason is it's a big country that shares a big border with them. But that doesn't tell the story. And here we come to emotion. Paul mentioned Kievan Rus, a principality that was twice the size of Ukraine and lasted roughly from 882 to 1240, after which it was absorbed by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I'm not going to get into the details, but I'd like you to keep in mind the following. The language of the East Slavs, that is the language that the Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians speak, evolved from Kievan Rus. As Paul mentioned, so does the religion, Orthodox Christianity, although not all Ukrainians are Orthodox uh, Christians. So does the first legal code of Russia under Yaroslav the Wise, a ruler of Kievan Rus. And finally, aspects of Russian culture, monasticism, iconography, uh, the worship of saints, and so on. Now, why do I say emotional? It is that if you look at Vladimir Putin, it's very hard to read what he's thinking. He has a poker face, except when he speaks about Ukraine. Then the body movement changes, the voice register changes, he begins to raise the decibel level of his, his voice, he begins to gesticulate, because I think for the reasons mentioned, the cultural and linguistic and religious roots, Vladimir Putin has a very difficult time, and not just him, but a lot of Russian nationalists, so you shouldn't think of this just as a Putin problem, of conceding that Ukraine is now an independent country. So if the strategic element says the direction of Ukraine, whether it belongs in the EU and NATO or with us, is very important, the emotional, religious, cultural aspect of it means our blood brothers, as it were, are drifting away from us in the West. Putin wrote about six months ago a 6,000-word essay, which I urge you to read. It's a little painful to read. But it is wild in terms of the potted history that it offers. So don't read it for accurate history, but read it to get a sense of the emotional depth which he and others like him uh, feel. Uh, he keeps saying even now that Ukraine is really not a state, it's an artificial state. But this is not just now during the war or just before the war. He told George W. Bush, George, he said, Ukraine not only doesn't have an independent history, it's not even really a state. So to summarize this part, Ukraine is important by virtue of geography and emotion. I forgot to add one other thing, and that is, remember the Dnieper River that I talked about? If you go east of that, that's a, a sort of a crude demarcation. The proportion of people who consider themselves either ethnic Russians who speak Russian as their mother tongue, or Ukrainians whose first language is Russian, whether they know Ukrainian or not, increases. And there has always been in Russian foreign policy, especially under Putin, but before him under his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin, who was the president between 91 and 2000, the sense that Russia has an obligation for the security and safety of its co-ethnics. Right, so this is why it's important. Did it make the war inevitable? As Paul says, absolutely not. Wars are a war of choice. My own view of this war is, and I am someone who has been long a critic of NATO expansion. I won't talk about it because Paul did. However much Mr. Putin's concerns about NATO expansion, this was not a war of necessity. It was a preventive war against a threat that he thought could happen. And just as I opposed the war of Iraq in 2003, I opposed this one, although I am seen as someone in the United States who's on the side of the debate that argues that NATO expansion was a fatal error because from the Russian side, they could not understand why the US would declare the Cold War over. And yet 
advance a, a, an alliance that was emblematic of the Cold War toward its borders. Let me move to the war. The first thing about the war, nobody predicted it. Everybody now says, well, they predicted it, but nobody predicted it except on the eve of the war, US intelligence. And there was a lot of skepticism about this because it goes back to the 2003 claim that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and, and what have you, or what would happen in Afghanistan when victory would come about. But this time they got it right. They said, it's not gonna be just a skirmish, it's gonna be a full blown invasion. But as for analysts like me, I'm here to tell you, I did not foresee it, mea culpa. I thought Putin was going to drive us right to the edge, scare everybody to death and say, now here are, is my deal. It's a little different than the deal I presented in the draft treaties offered in December of 2021, which were quite uh, outlandish. And I can speak about that in the Q&A if you'd like me to. Then I thought if he uses force, he maybe will push out the boundaries of the two republics. They occupy now about a third of Lugansk and Donetsk, give or take. I thought he would push them out to include all of Lugansk and Donetsk. So the precursor of the war is that he recognized these two republics. Now, what was surprising is that he did so soon after meeting with President Emmanuel Macron of France. And during the conversation with Macron, there was a long discussion about the Minsk process. So this is an on again, off again process that's been going on since 2015. And the idea is there should be a peace settlement within Ukraine. And the terms of the deal are that Ukraine will give the two Russian statelets autonomy within Ukraine. Russian forces will leave and there will be elections in Lugansk and Donetsk and so on. For complicated reasons, this process was stuck, but Putin told Macron, I want this process revived. No sooner did Macron leave than he recognized the two states as independent and said their jurisdiction extends to all of Lugansk and Donetsk. In other words, he slapped Macron in the face, but worse than that, he torpedoed the Minsk process because it is now a dead letter. So the first surprise was the war. We knew that something was cooking because this buildup began in March of last year, 2021. It started ramping up at the end of 2021. By December, people were saying something definitely is up. On the eve of the war, the Russians had deployed about 120 to 130,000 troops, including regular army plus National Guard troops. Police troops, I think they meant to use to uh, police, as it were, uh, big cities. But I still didn't think there was an invasion and I was not alone. So the first surprise, there was a war. And a war to invade a country and change its government based on the ludicrous theory that it was dominated by neo-Nazis, something that Putin says again, and even Sergei Lavrov, a very sophisticated, suave, well-known diplomat repeats um, also. The textbook Russian army war of this sort would have begun like this. Cyber attacks against main communication nodes and command and control systems, followed by massive artillery and airstrikes against weapons and ammunition dumps and frontline forces of Ukraine, taking command then of the air, deploying Russian warplanes to create an air umbrella and denying it therefore to the Ukrainian Air Force, and then setting the stage for a massive combined, air, combined arms operation. Tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery, all moving into Ukraine. Nothing of the sort happened. The early weeks of the campaign had everybody scratching their head because this was supposedly the, 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 the mighty Russian army that Vladimir Putin had created by pumping a lot of money into it after 2008. But what did happen? A couple of desultory forays, not using their tactical um, combat tactical brigades, about 900 people each with combined arms. Those were not used. Logistics, breakdown of equipment, running out of fuel, running out of water, running out of food. You had Ukrainian young conscripts 
scrounging around in villages trying to gin up food. You did not have a rapid seizure of territory. You did not have control of airspace. Nobody can understand why this happened. I have a theory, however. Generally speaking, when wars begin, the initiator believes the following, that the adversary is inferior and therefore too will be defeated very, very quickly. And finally, that the firepower that you have will prove invincible. There's an enormous amount of confidence about this. And part of the, the desultory first, camp, the first stages of the campaign was Putin thought, I'll push in, the government will rapidly collapse. Volodymyr Zelensky will run away like Ashraf Ghani did after the, um, the Taliban were about to take Afghanistan. In the event, um, Zelensky, a former uh, comedian who had a TV show, was elected president, has become almost like a mythical Churchillian figure and he's rallied the country. Why were Russian forces blunted in the way that they did? There are two answers. The Ukrainians, it turns out, have been preparing for this since 2015. They were, not, they were occupied in the Donbass with the breakaway statelets and there was an artillery barrage going on on either side of the line of control, but they expected a Russian invasion. They trained for it, they drilled for it, they prepared for it. Second, Western and particularly US arms and training. Uh, there is a city called Yavriv, uh, east of Lviv, which I showed you on the map. Russia, American and Canadian forces have been training Russian forces there since 2015. The United States has given Ukraine to date something like $3.5 billion. The weapons include the Javelin anti-tank guided missile. It's a fire and forget weapon. You aim it more or less in the direction of the, uh, the piece of armor you want to destroy and it does the rest. Stinger shoulder-fired shoulder -fired missiles, it does the same thing. This is one of the reasons why the Mujahideen in Afghanistan began to take a huge toll on Soviet helicopters and aircraft. And um, uh, counter battery radars. Now, what are these? These, the, these are pieces of equipment that locate radar far away, radar of artilleries, zoom in and destroy multiple rocket launchers, which has been a major item of Russian warfare. Finally, Turkish drones. The Ukrainians have a drone called the Punisher, but it was combined with something called the Bayraktar, a Turkish drone. By the way, Bayraktar is the son-in-law of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, but we'll leave that discussion for another day. It's wreaked havoc on Russian armor. So what are the Russians doing now? And let me try to bring that map up again with your permission. There are four axes of advance from Chernihiv south to Kiev. These have been slow motion marches for advances of the reason I talk, talked about. From Kharkiv in the northeast, from the Donbass toward the Crimean Peninsula to create a land bridge. They have a sea bridge now, uh, over the sea that is, connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland, but they now want to create a land bridge. And then finally, huge operations along the Black Sea coast, centered north of Crimea in uh, the province of Kherson, K-H-E-R-S-O-N. What is the goal? To push the borders of the Crimean Peninsula northward so that the water canals that the Ukrainians control can be regained by Russia. But the ultimate goal, ladies and gentlemen, is a much bigger one than that. It is to reduce Ukraine to a landlocked country by taking away its Black Sea coast and the Sea of Azov to make Ukraine a landlocked country. That would be a crippling defeat. Now, by pointing to all these, I'm not saying that they will succeed. I'm trying to tell you what the war has been like lately. There's a big Ukrainian army in the east. The Russians want to encircle it and destroy it, and they feel that the Ukrainians won't be able to resist uh, after that. 
The war has also uh, featured, because of the frustration, I think, of President Putin, unconscionable attacks on civilian population centers, hospitals, apartment buildings. If you don't believe me, go and check out the evidence on video or follow any of the real experts, Michael Kaufman in my country, who write about war from a very knowledgeable place, and you will see this. So that's what the war is like now. And I'll talk to you later about whether this war will be won and so on. Sanctions. It's the only thing we could do, the West. Because President Biden said, we won't send American sons and daughters to fight in Ukraine. He made that absolutely clear. That was a, there was a red line. And even Biden's fiercest critics, nobody has told him, you've got to send American kids to die in fighting for Ukraine. So sanctions were imposed. What kind of sanctions? First, a whole bunch of oligarchs close to Putin were sanctioned. President Putin himself was sanctioned. A whole bunch of senior officials, including Lavrov, the chairman of the National Security Council, um, was sanctioned. The head of the FSB was sanctioned, the Foreign Intelligence Service, and so on. So individuals close to Putin. Private oligarchs were sanctioned. Mikhail Friedman, for example. They became wealthy under Putin. The idea was if they broke with the war, then something would happen to change Putin's mind. That's a forlorn hope, I'm afraid. And then sanctions were imposed on the Russian Central Bank. Russia has about the fifth largest foreign currency reserves in the world. It's about $680 billion, give or take. 50% of it is in dollars in the West. The Russian Central Bank no longer has access to that money, which means it cannot use it to buy up rubles. The ruble is in free fall. People are panicking. Things that are imported cost much more. Inflation is up. Shortages are up. And uh, it's been a very, very tough. Um, it's been very tough sledding for, for Russia. However, the energy sector has not been sanctioned. And this is important because 40% of Europe's gas, natural gas, comes from uh, Russia through undersea pipeline plus three pipeline, uh, three uh, landborne pipelines, uh, land-based pipelines, excuse me. But what people may not know, although many of you may, is that Russia is also the biggest crude oil su uh, supplier to the Europeans. About 26% of their oil comes from Russia. So the Europeans said, whatever you do, please don't sanction oil, especially in the wintertime, because we'll be sweet. Now, I want to tell you another story about sanctions, because here's the thing. The deeper and wider you make them, there are two consequences. Ordinary Russians who have nothing to do with Putin's war and may not in some proportion even support it. And there's a lot of evidence of demonstrations and so on, and the draconian methods that have been used to contain them show that the regime is worried about this. They will be affected. But so will we. Oil prices in inflation-adjusted terms are the highest they've been since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Wheat prices, Russia and Ukraine together account for about 30% of the world's wheat exports. Wheat prices have skyrocketed. Ukraine is the sixth largest producer of corn. Corn prices have skyrocketed. The price for shipping things in container shipping, right? the big container shipping lines, seven or eight of the mo biggest ones have said, we're not going to Russia and Ukraine and we're not coming out of Russia and Ukraine because insurance rates have skyrocketed. Supply chains that were disrupted severely by the pandemic have become much, much worse. You may see it if you try to order something on Amazon or, or, or what have you. Um, inflation in the West, in the US it's already very, very high, could increase, but growth could decrease. And there's talk of going back to the 1970s phase that we experienced here called stagflation. The bottom line is if you really wanna make sanctions tough, there's gonna be blowback against you and eventually there'll be pressure. Already the Republicans are saying here that th these are not 
um, President Putin's gas price increases, they are President Biden's gas price increases. You have to have spent time here during our elections to know how uh, insane <laughs> they can be. Arming uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is being armed. I wrote a piece in the Guardian yesterday that was by some people misunderstood as saying, don't arm Ukraine. It was no such thing. It was saying the following. Arming, the arming of Ukraine is going on. Let us think of the first and second and third order consequences that may occur, but which we have not yet thought about. So let's, let me give you one example. Supply convoys will be coming across the Polish border into Ukraine. Let me just bring up this map again. Uh, see the Polish-Ukraine border, be coming across the Polish-Ukrainian border and the Romanian-Ukrainian border. Three days ago, having left this part of the country largely alone, except in the first couple of days of the war, the Russians began airstrikes on the city of Lutsk, about 15 miles from the Polish border, uh, on uh, Yavriv, the base that I mentioned where American training was going on and demolished it. And in a place called Ivano-Frankivsk, it has a province by the same name adjoining uh, Romania. This to me is a sign that the Russians will not sit still while the convoys come in with weapons. So far, about 17,000 17, anti-tank weapons of various types, including stingers, they're not all stingers, uh, are in uh, Poland and Romania, principally in Poland, waiting to come in. The Russians know that this can be a game changer and they might attack the convoys. Their deputy uh, foreign minister, Sergei Ryabkov said three or four days ago that the convoys will become targets. If the Russians attack uh, the convoys, what is our next step? Will we send convoys protected by surface-to-air missiles? If the Russians attempt to attack them, will we shoot down Russian planes? Could that give rise to a confrontation between NATO and the, um, the, the Russian forces? Given that the United States and Russia have nuclear weapons, this is a very serious problem, I can assure you. What happens if the Ukrainians begin to lose because the Russian military juggernaut just ultimately crushes them? Will we say, well, nice try, colleagues, uh, we're going to leave now, or do we have a plan B? Will we support an insurgency? Will we send NATO troops into Western Ukraine to create some kind of a rump Ukrainian state uh, with an exile, with, with a government that can function? Right? What if by accident, targets in Poland or Romania are struck and these countries invoke Article 5. So my point was not don't arm the Ukrainians. I don't make those decisions. They're already being armed. It was to think about this, but the emotional pitch of the debate here has gotten so intense that if people disagree with one another now, it's not that, oh, he looked at the evidence and reached his conclusion. It is that he's anti-Putin or pro-Putin. And this is a ridiculous way in which to make decisions. Very quickly, the no-fly zone. Uh, there is a petition going around signed by about 45 uh, people to do it. There is a larger petition of 70 to say, don't do it. I'm one of the signatories. Why did I sign it? Because if you put a no-fly zone down, you have to have a plan B if Russian warplanes breach it. Are you prepared to shoot them down? If you shoot them down, what will the the Russians do. You've got to game that out before you take that first step. Elementary rule of strategy, don't take the first step until you figured out the second. So a no-fly zone is a very dangerous thing. President Zelensky has called for it. There's enormous sympathy in the West for him because of his heroic leadership of Ukraine. So that's where the no-fly zone stands. Regime change. This should be an opportunity, especially through the sanctions, to bring down Putin once and for all. There are articles now being published. Putin will fall. Well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. One thing this war has told me is do less prediction, fewer predictions. 
Um, here's the problem with regime change. Two outcomes could be like this. Another authoritarian leader uh, emerges from the house that Putin built and says, oh, this is a terrible war. It's Vladimir's fault. Let me leave, pull Russia out, and let me try to repair relations with the West. Fairly good, even better. And the hope of many liberal internationalists here, there will be now a democratic uh, Russia. The problem with that is that uh, demonstrations and protests will be put down very brutally by this regime. And we sitting in Washington or Palo Alto or New York ought to have the humility not to egg people on and see them slaughtered unless we are prepared to do something to stop it, and we are not. Those two possibilities, however, cannot be the course for policy unless you can rule out a third, which is certainly plausible. Violence, chaos, upheaval, and civil conflict in the world's second largest nuclear state. In conclusion, how are we to see this war? I would say this, it might end in a military victory, but it will amount to a strategic defeat for Putin. Why? Because war is not waged for the sake of killing people, unless people are psychopaths who order the war, it's for political purpose. But what has been the result of this war? The West is unified as never before. There are calls to beef up American troops in, uh, in, in Europe. Putin wanted fewer, he's gonna have more. Finland and Sweden, not aligned, are talking about joining NATO. Much more powerful, by the way, than Ukraine, both of them, for various reasons. And uh, Ukraine, uh, Putin has a country next door to him now, which has become a bastion of hatred and whose national identity has become closely connected with a negative view of Russia. This never used to be the case. Ukrainians and Russians were in, in the Soviet period very closely interconnected. He has created that breach. And then of course, what do you do if you win Ukraine? Do you put a puppet government in power? Well, that government won't last very long. Are you gonna babysit it forever? Or are you going to hive off parts of Ukraine and say, you're gonna call it a victory? So I don't know how the war will end. I don't know who will win the war, but I cannot see any long range good for Putin or indeed Russia coming out of it. So Andreas, I'm sorry if I exceeded my time limit. I will stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Rajan, for this uh, very detailed and, and sobering assessment of, of the current situation and, and how it might unfold. Uh, and, you know, it is, it is probably not wrong to say that this is one of or the most important existential issue that we're facing in the 21st century. And uh, not only is it existential, it's also a complex issue where we don't know what the outcome will be. You know, these, these things, there's so many moving parts that are interacting and interdependent on each other that uh, it is more or less impossible to play a game of chess here with a certain outcome. So, Rajan, thank you very much for, for a really uh, good erudite account of this. And also, once again, thank you very much to Paul for, for giving us all the context, all the background, the historic and the current context. So thank you very much to both of you. That's in lieu of applause, which obviously you can't have when people are muted. Uh, but we get to the Q&A session now, and there's quite a few questions in the chat room, as you might imagine. Now, I'm trying to get through most of them, but that would facilitate uh, you hopefully being relatively brief, uh, both Paul and 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 Rajan in your response. The first one goes to Paul and it's for Michelle. Was this divide between the West and Russia just about feelings of national security or were access to natural resources also at play? Yeah, this is a good question and Rajan may have something to say about this as well. Um, there has been some rivalry in the post-Soviet years, um, some competition to get access to raw materials, particularly in the Caspian Sea Basin in Central Asia. Um, my, my sense is that that had largely abated, and so I don't see it as a, a driving force for the war. I think since the 19, uh, since the, you know, roughly 2000, I think the, um, I think the market had sort of, uh, was doing a good job of allocating those, those resources, even though the market, you know, was in part occupied by Russian state-owned firms. Um, 
there are some important natural resources uh, implications, and Rajan pointed to some of them, particularly involving um, things like wheat, uh, corn, uh, natural gas, oil, but also some minerals, palladium, which goes in natural, uh, uh, goes in catalytic converters for automobiles. So um, I, I think resource competition is relatively far down on the list of causes of the war, but it's certainly high on the list of, of consequences. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. That's, that's very good. Another question for you, Paul, and that is, is it your view that Putin's view of the historical justification for the re-annexation of the Ukraine is actually reasonable or at least understandable? So this is quite a uh, pointed question. Yeah, I, I don't think it's um, either reasonable or understandable. I, it's certainly understandable, and I, I try really hard to understand it. You, you have to try to see things from other people's perspective. I think that's important. Um, you know, my view of it is, I think initially um, he glommed on to these things that Russian nationalists have been saying in one way or another for decades or centuries um, as ways of building a case. Okay. Um, my sense is, is that the more he said them, uh, the more he started to believe them himself. And so I think it started out as cynicism and ended up with, uh, with righteousness in, in a strange way. And actually, I thought um, Rajan captured this, this, this fairly well. I think he's actually gotten emotional about this um, when he talks about Ukraine. I don't think it started that way. Okay, there's one for Rajan now. And uh, uh, the talk is about the West. Uh, are you talking, uh, it is as given as America is the West? Or what is the view of the West European countries, Rajan? Very, very good question. So I'm certainly not conflating the United States with the West or saying that the U.S., can or should speak on behalf of Europeans. What I am saying is that NATO is an alliance of 30 people and the EU has, I don't know how many, I lost track, a number of people. And usually in these kinds of coalitions, there's a collective action problem. They can't decide what to do quickly enough. And what I'm struck by is how quickly they've come together on this occasion and could you say the United States played a role? Yes, but so did Macron and so did uh, um, Chancellor Schultz in Germany and so did uh, Boris Johnson in, uh, in the UK. So that is what I mean by the West. I mean, essentially, NATO countries who belong to the West plus the US, but also certain non-aligned countries like Sweden and Finland that are sending weapons to Ukraine Switzerland that's taken the unusual role of blocking some accounts. So that, that is what I mean by the West. And I certainly don't mean just the United States. Okay. Well, there's another question which I think carries on from this. And that is, any thoughts on the EU's contribution to the crisis with its Eastern Plan, Initiative of 2009, and Article 47.2 on mutual defence in its Lisbon Treaty of 2007? And the question goes on. But I mean, let's, let's concentrate mm. on that. Well, this is clearly a very well-informed audience. Um, the way that Putin looked at the Eastern Partnership, which was kind of roughly speaking, getting certain countries ready to enter the antechamber for some kind of relationship with the EU. They have to go through lots of processes and begin with the EU. He didn't view this, and you know, Paul may want to speak to this also, he didn't view this simply as an economic trans uh, transaction. He viewed it ultimately as a very wealthy, technologically advanced coalition, the EU, um, with living standards that many people in these countries aspire to, moving away from Russia and toward them, uh, certain countries. In the 2013-14 uh, conflict, you will all remember that it began over an innocuous thing called an association agreement between the EU and Ukraine. Then President Yanukovych, after he got a large loan from President Putin, put it uh, on the back burner, mothballed it, protest broke out. Then for complicated reasons that I can't get into, they cascade and Yanukovych falls. Putin views this as an American-inspired plot. Now, in his defense, <laughs> there are certain things that we have to bear in mind. 
a phone call between a high level American official and, and the American ambassador discussing the composition of the future U Ukrainian um, uh, government post Yanukovych. Uh, senior senators and the same official showing up on the Maidan and distributing sweets or whatever, water to the demonstrators. So Putin saw this and he keeps referring to this as a coup. So the answer to your question is the Eastern partnership was never seen as purely an economic phenomenon it was seen as a strategic phenomenon thank you for that paul do you want to add anything to that yeah i will add and this gets a little bit technical but but the, the question was technical so let's do it um the one of the um aspects of this East, of this association agreement was going to be a free trade area between ukraine and the european union russia had its own aspirations for a free trade area uh, to compose russia kazakhstan belarus and ukraine and of course belarus uh, ukraine was the big prize there uh, economically. Um, but you couldn't have both those projects at the same time, because if, if Ukraine had free trade with Russia and with the EU, that would mean Russia had free trade with the EU. And neither the Russians nor the Europeans wanted that, largely because Russia wants to protect certain of its industries from competition from the EU. And so this was a place where, for te really te almost technocratic economic reasons, it was a zero-sum game. Ukraine couldn't go both ways. And, um, and and that put Ukraine in a position to choose something that it probably didn't want to choose. Um, so, so yeah, there was this inexorable logic of EU enlargement that, that, again, crashed into Russia's notion of what Europe should look like. Okay, thank you. And it wasn't all about NATO, which is an important point. Yeah, okay. No, that's fine. This is a question for, for either of you, uh, and it's probably the interesting question. Does the invasion make us reassess some of the events of the last 15 to 20 years in the West, such as killing in London's, killings in London and Berlin, Brexit or the US election events? And I think what's behind the question is, is, is there a zeitgeist of increased nationalization and national, 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 national feeling, nationalism and, and uh, separation rather than union? So let me try to answer the question this way, and I, ho I hope I'm answering it. And if not, <laughs> please tell me, or Paul will answer it better. There has been for a long time now evidence that democracy is undergoing some kind of crisis, maybe not a terminal one, but a serious one. Had you told me three years ago that we would have in this country an armed mob taking over the capital, I would have bet probably my year's salary on it. It was inconceivable that that would happen. If you told me that one of the main opposition parties would actually bless this event, I would have said it was impossible. If you told me we had a president who was openly courting authoritarian figures, I would have said it's so. But it's not just in the US. You have far-right parties and movements in Europe. You know this better than I do. You have um, Narendra Modi in India. There is something that has gone on uh, it's too complicated to discuss here, uh, is Putin part of it? There is no question that some of the critics of democracy as something that doesn't work, as something that dilutes people's identity through multiculturalism and immigration, view him as an archetype, as an alternative to democracy. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think he captured that part of the question uh, better than I could. So I'm going to take up the other part, which is about things like poisonings. And, um, and my feeling about that is, and, and, and you know, the, the poisoning, some of the most important poisonings were, of course, in the UK, not in California. Um, but, you know, the, the British government um, and other governments in the West responded, but at the same time really made a decision to compartmentalize those events. Right. They didn't see them as fundamentally changing their notion of what Putin was about um, or what Russia and the Russian government was about. And I think it, to the answer to the question, will we look back at those things in retrospect differently? I think the answer is probably yes, is I think those will now be seen as um, signs that this was a different kind of person than we thought they were we, uh, we were dealing with that, that maybe we should have paid more attention to. Just a quick asterisk, if I might, Andres, and I'll keep it very bright. <laughs> You know, we shouldn't be entirely surprised by this because Mr. Putin's uh, enemies have a, a strange habit of uh, landing up, ending up dead. So we had Boris Nemtsov, uh, probably the next important opposition leader. We had the most uh, intrepid investigative reporter, Anna Politkovskaya. 
So uh, doing away with enemies in the most brutal way is not a new thing. What happened when this reached out into the West is a much more serious step. It's been going on in Russia for quite some time. Okay. Uh, and this is a question for, to both of you. And again, I think you both mentioned it. What lies behind Putin's Russia's claim that Ukraine is ruled by Nazis? <laughs> Maybe I'll pick up on that one where I left off in about in about you know 1945. Um, so there were these um, Ukrainian nationalist groups that collaborated with uh, Germany, um, pri primarily, of course, because they they thought that nothing could be worse than Stalin, and of course they turned out to be wrong. Um, but to bring it up to date, when you get to the um, one of these one of these people, a guy named Stepan Bandera, was seen among Ukrainian nationalists as a hero for fighting against the Soviets but was seen by many others as a war, a war criminal for his work with the Germans. Ukrainian President um, um, Viktor Yushchenko, when he was leaving office in 2010, gave posthumously this guy Bondera the award um, Hero of Ukraine. So it seemed like the government was valorizing this, this uh, person who participated in the Holocaust. Um, and then in 2014, some of the, of the couple of hundred thousand people who protested out on the Maidan, and I was there and I saw it, Some of them were from far right groups, um, and some of those far right groups, right, were were these people that you might call um, um, neo fascists or ultra nationalists, and some of those people went on to fight against Russian troops in um, eastern Ukraine. Always a tiny slice, always a tiny minority. Um, they the far right never gets more than a few percentage points again in, in elections. In contrast with Russia, um, but there's just a little kernel of truth there. So that um, Putin says it, and he says it because it resonates with Americans. They, we all want to know about it, or not just the Western audience in general wants to know about it. Um, and of course, because it resonates with, with Russia, which sees its greatest heroism in fighting against fascism. And I always point out, it's a master stroke of propaganda on Putin's part, because every single interview I'm in, and I've been in a lot of them, I get asked about this. Yeah. And so he always gets us talking about Ukrainian fascists. And so it's genius. Okay. Okay. Uh, Roger, do you want to add anything to that or should we go to the next question? Just very quickly, I, I think what Paul said is absolutely right. Uh, I think you could say there are neo-Nazi and white nationalist movements in the United States. Of course. But the question is, is the United States government run by neo-Nazis? Uh, the answer is, of course, no. And the idea that you, uh, Kiev is in the, under the control of neo-Nazis is preposterous. There are certainly groups such as the ones Paul mentioned. There are historical figures who've been rehabil rehabilitated, but that's a far cry from a yeah. government sitting in Kiev that's run by Nazis. I, I should add one more thing to this, which is, you know, the Ukrainians did something which is inconceivable in Russia. And I have a feeling not so likely in the United States either, which is they elected a, a Jewish person president of their country. Uh, Zelensky himself is Jewish, lost family in the Holocaust. And for a while after he was president, um, Ukraine was the only country besides Israel with a Jewish president and prime minister. I actually wonder, I, uh, this is speculation, but I wonder whether the fact that Zelensky is Jewish is one of the things that makes uh, Putin so angry that uh, he's standing up to him. Okay. Another question here is, given that the West have ruled out direct military contact with Russia, Putin seems completely unthreatened by the West. What or who could possibly uh, convince Putin to bring this war to an end? I think what will bring the war to an end is that the Ukrainians will continue to be people who cannot be defeated easily, that big cities like Kiev will not be taken, will not surrender even after sieges like the one that's happened in Mariupol, Ukraine southeast near the Azov border, which has been under siege and has been in horrific shape. Some cities that kind of have been taken like Kharkiv will slip out of their grasp Ukrainian uh, Russian losses will mount, supplies will run out, and there somebody will be looking for a deal. Likewise, Ukrainians might say, we need now to think of saving the state. We can't lose everything. So what would the terms of a settlement look like? I don't think militarily, other than arms supplies to Ukraine, anything is going to get Putin's attention because he knows that no power is going to project forces into Ukraine to fight alongside it. Okay. I think the, the key question, the key question is about the, the average Russian soldier. Um, how long do they maintain the morale to really do the, the dirty work? 
It's one thing to lob in artillery shells, but sooner or later soldiers have to go in and they have to die. Um, I, I, say, I say the focus is really on the Russian soldier. The, the flip side of that is uh, the staying power of first the Ukrainian army and then the Ukrainian uh, insurgents who, who are already beginning to you know, um, get organized. Okay, another question, which I think yeah, both of you commented on, this is probably one to Rajan. How far will the West be prepared to go with accepting economic impacts as a result of this crisis to support Ukraine? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Yeah. My answer would be that uh, we have felt the effects already in the one thing that the United States, whose people are in love with the automobile, notice above all. And that is the price of gas. Uh, Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in California, we're edging up to $5 a gallon. Over. Over. That's a lot. And I haven't checked lot. the prices in New York because although I own a car, I'm a New Yorker and I walk or take the subway. And I don't, I don't drive. I can drive, but I, but I don't. Uh, but prices of other things have gone up. So the question is, who has more staying power? Uh, will people in the West say at one point, this war is coming home to affect our pocketbooks, we have to find some kind of settlement, or will there be protests in Russia that force Putin uh, to, to back down? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a very interesting question. It has to do with the blowback effect uh, of, of sanctions. Yeah. Uh, Paul, any view? I, I actually, I, I agree with that. I, I think it's very hard to predict the, the staying power of uh, sort of the, the Western publics, and, and they, we may not all go in the same direction, right? The West is not um, homogenous. You say you may see some countries in which governments are elected that say it's it's time to cut to cut and run on this, where others um, they're they're willing to endure for longer, and that that's what makes the politics of the alliance so interesting. Equally interesting is the question: is is there any mechanism that would connect the hardship of the average Russian up to the Russian government? And I'm fairly skeptical about that. Okay. Okay, the, another question. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, but uh, what role does the UN have to play? Or is it rendered completely useless by the Russian veto? Uh, well, there was a resolution that uh, most, I think 143 members out of 193 voted for it. There were some abstentions, um, including big countries like India, India. Um, um, Indonesia and China. So if you add up population, you can say, well, did Putin win or not? But apart from, and that was a General Assembly resolution, by the way, UN Security Council resolution would be killed by the Russians. There can be expressions of outrage and naming and shaming and so on, but that's not going to, you know, Putin is not somebody whose feelings get hurt easily. That's not what's going to change this war. It's going to be his calculation of the costs exceed the gains. Okay. Uh, and one more question is about, would, would uh, uh, Ukraine not be better off with some of the Eastern states as, as, uh, a, as a self-functioning uh, uh, country? Yeah, this is a tricky, a tricky subject um, because, of course, my Ukrainian friends don't like it so much when I start talking about giving away their territory. No. Um, but I think one of the reasons why this conflict sort of froze, it didn't quite freeze, but but... Uh, got less hot after 2014 is there was a sense actually that nobody really wants Donetsk and, and Luhansk. Um, the Ukrainians have, uh, have a more coherent political um, uh, entity without it. Um, and economically, it doesn't really contribute anything to, to either state. And so I think to, to the point that, that Rajan was uh, um, referring, you know, when you get down to um, negotiating some kind of peace, peace treaty, you, there are parts of Ukrainian territory that Ukraine might be more willing to surrender than others. Okay. Just a, just a quick, I know we're out of time, just a very quick point. If there's a peace settlement, the Russians will demand that Ukraine in some way, shape or form forfeit Crimea or recognize it. It could be like the two Germany, Germanys during World War II, neither mm -hmm. recognize the other, but each recognized that they existed. Mm -hmm. And they will recognize, they, they will want Donbass to be recognized as independent. The sticking point will be, will it include all of Luhansk and Donetsk? I think that'll be a bitter pill for uh, Russia to swallow. President Zelensky has said things that suggest that he's open to discussing this, including, by the way, 
neutrality, but it would have to be armed neutrality because the Ukraine that is not allowed to arm itself from whichever source it wants weapons and training is not a neutral Ukraine. It's a Ukraine that's under the Russian shadow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I think we draw things to uh, a conclusion. Obviously, uh, there's raucous applause in the background uh, beyond beyond the moot, uh, both Paul and Rajan, and uh, certainly uh, in the chat room, lots of claps, etc., going on, which is great. And uh, somebody says, "Thank you for the best discussion on Ukraine yet." So I think that's that's a very good testimony and a terrific thank you. And they're all coming in now in the chat room. So it's it's great to see. Uh, and I tell that to my wife, Andreas. Pardon? <laughs> they're all coming from your wife. Well, she's a very quick typer, I must say. Um, but now, thank you very much, Paul and Rajan, for a very erudite, very meaningful and very somber account of where we are at the moment. You know, we are at the cusp of, of a very... Uh, dangerous and existential issue not just for ukraine where we see these images every single day but on a, on a global basis and uh, you know let's hope reason prevails uh, at some point and actually this can be uh, solved uh, to, to is a win-win for most parties involved because uh, you know this is something that is of of significance at a global scale just before i go i just want to tell you a little bit but just two things are happening next month uh, we have a business and economics lecture by georg kell on the rise of sustainable investing he's kind of zooming into into the brilsey the elwin room from new york and then on the 19th of April, we have Professor Rob Wortham from Bath University giving a talk on artificial intelligence. So that's April. So please tune in for that. And uh, I just close today by saying I'm sure all of us will be following uh, the the uh, the events in the Ukraine very closely. Our thoughts are with everybody involved in the conflict. And, uh, you know, there's three million people who have fl uh, you know, fleed so far from, from there. And most of them are in Poland and, and heading uh, towards the rest of Europe. So I think, you know, uh, anything that we as individuals can do to help people in this crisis uh, is going to be great. So I'll finish as I always finish with these things. And that says, stay healthy, stay safe, and most importantly, stay sane. All the very best, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.